You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Winston Churchill and says, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Our guest today is a New York Times bestselling author, former professional athlete, and the founder and CEO of Healthpreneur. As one of the world's top business strategists, Yuri Elkaim has helped more than half a million people to take ownership of their health. And you could say that for Yuri, the pathway to health and business was inevitable. After dealing with a host of health issues as a teenager, Yuri eventually lost all of his hair at 17 years old to an autoimmune condition. This, along with his passion for sports, which led him down the path of playing professional soccer in his early 20s, propelled him into the health and fitness field. Yuri's authentic and caring approach allowed him to build a successful online health empire while providing him the platform to write three best-selling books and share his message on major media outlets like Dr. Oz and The Doctors. In 2018, after 13 years at the helm, Yuri sold this health business to focus on Healthpreneur full-time. With Healthpreneur, Yuri and his world-class team help health professionals and coaches leverage the internet to turn their expertise into high six and seven figure virtual practices that create transformative results for more people without the grind. Healthpreneur's mission is to help health entrepreneurs make their dreams happen in the service of others and eventually leave a legacy where every man, woman, and child has the opportunity to become the best version of themselves so that they can wake up each day with purpose, contribute through meaningful work that feels like play, and live freely and abundantly. And I think we can all agree that's one hell of a mission. In this episode, we're going to go through a ton of amazing things. We're going to go through how a devastating medical diagnosis revealed Yuri's mission, what the top 1% of entrepreneurs do to achieve a seven-figure or better income, how holistic nutrition can change your life, the problem with professional services that exchange time for money, and how to find your passion and turn it into a profitable business. Yuri is a super accomplished guy, and I know you're going to get a ton of value out of this one. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one who needs to hear this episode, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Yuri Elkain. Yuri, great to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for coming on the Win the Day show. Absolutely, James. Thanks for having me, buddy. It's good to be here. Well, you've had some big wins in the holistic health space, and it's also what changed your life. But there's there's so much misinformation about health, particularly these days with the internet. To kick things off, are there any myths that need to be busted about exactly what holistic health is? I mean, we could, we could, how much time do you have? (laughs) We could be here for a long time. I mean, listen, like the thing is, when I got into nutrition, the deeper I went into it, the more I realized. I had no clue what was going on. And the thing is like, there's so many different approaches and I think every one of them can work for different people, right? Um, I found an approach that worked for me, which was mostly plant-based and I just felt the best, but I also know that there's a huge population of the earth that is very keto-based, animal product-based, and that's totally fine. So I think what like, you know, in my journey of having done that for so long, the thing that I came to realize is like, do what's best for you. Right. And and I think, I think part of that is about experimenting with different things to find out what's going to resonate most with you. But I think even beyond like our food choices is the energetic intention or the energy that we feel in that pursuit. So if you're sitting down and having a supposedly healthy meal and you feel shame or guilt around that food, because it's not organic or perfect enough, I, there's, there's an energy around that. That's not going to be great for your body compared to someone who's going to have a beautiful grass fed burger with zero shame and guilt and enjoying that. So I think the, in short, it's not just what you eat, but it's how you approach what you eat. And I think that was a big thing that I learned over the years. And that's, I think how I approach a lot of my stuff now. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm less fanatical about my diet now than I was back in the day. Cause I've recognized how, how important that energy and that attention is. So 
Yeah. Yeah. Big thing you mentioned there is that experimentation. There's so many people out there that are trying to dictate exactly what other people should do without any context of exactly what's going on with that person or what yeah. their goals are. And for people to get out of their comfort zone and, and perhaps stop those habits that they're doing to go and try a few of those different things, I think is, is really, really important. Just before your 17th birthday, you noticed significant hair loss and were subsequently diagnosed with the autoimmune condition alopecia. Can you mm-hmm. take us into those circumstances and how it changed your mindset at the time? Yeah, I think it was the universe's way of giving me a bit of a kick in the ass, to be honest with you, because I was that, if you were the, the stereotypical high school movie where you have like the jock and the good looking guy with the girlfriend and the hair, that was kind of me, but I was, I, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I was nice. I was nice to most people except to my brother. I was a bit of a, <laughs> a Grinch to my younger brother. And I think the universe said, okay, dude, we've had enough of this. Here's a, uh, here's your payback. So, get off your pedestal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my brother would tease me. He teases me now. Like, Hey, I remember back in the day when you used to spend like 30 minutes in the bathroom, you know, doing your hair. I was like, yeah, good days. <laughs> so anyways. Um, yeah. So in the space of a couple of weeks, I, I literally went from and just the context, my dad's Moroccan. So there was a lot of hair, bushy eyebrows, hair all over. Um, and in the space of a couple of weeks, like all of it was gone. And that was a big, like what is going on here? And it was weird because I was in my last year of high school and just seeing how people looked at me was, was kind of odd. Like, you know, it's like, what's wrong with this guy? He looks like an alien or is he going through cancer or whatever? So that was a really, again, it was awkward. Um, but to be honest with you, I think I handled it pretty well. And I think it really, I've always been very mature, even from a young age. And I think you know, that, that, that experience really allowed me to recognize it's only hair, man. Like, come on, like there's far worse that could be happening. So I think I had friends and family members who were like, Oh my God, is everything okay? It must be so hard for you. I was like, well, I mean, whatever. It's not the end of the world. There could be worse things. So I think my perspective was really helpful, but it was also, you know, in retrospect, it was a blessing because that was the impetus that really got me into the health space because the solution the medical community had was yeah we'll just inject your head with cortisone i'm like are you for real so i didn't really get any solid answers medically and i that really prompted me into studying kinesiology because i had a really big passion for soccer and fitness and then uh, nutrition to learn more about what was happening in my body And, and those two things really made a huge difference for me i was able to regrow my hair back when i was 24 25 uh, because of a lot of these changes I was making from a, a dietary perspective, I obviously don't have any hair now. That's because a number of years ago, long story short, took my son to the doctor. Uh, my doctor was like, hey, while you're here, why don't you just get a tetanus shot or a booster? I was like, okay, sure. I didn't even question her. And within two weeks, my hair fell out again. So that was uh, just so everyone knows you know, what's going on. Um, but who cares? Like, I don't, I don't really think about it anymore. And it's you know, I think it's a blessing to be honest, because it's, it's allowed me to put things into perspective and approach difficult situations with a lot more grace and perspective. So that's kind of how it all started. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's that attitude to adversity. I mean, that is, in my experience, it's that that's the difference between ordinary people and, and extraordinary achievers. It's how you respond to adversity when it inevitably strikes is that different. And we sometimes have no idea what's going to come out of left field to, to really knock us off course. And what I love about your journey is you really had to take the reins yourself. Like you had to dive deep into the holistic nutrition and health space to start to get some answers. Why was it that you weren't actually getting any, uh, like, how was that condition not really on the radar from all the previous medical professionals and things that, that you had seen? Why was it on you as an individual at the end of the day to try and figure out what the hell was going on? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there were some tremendous uh, health professionals out there who probably did have a solution. I just didn't know who they were at the time. So, you know, my mom, you know, exposed me to a variety of practitioners, medical doctors, immunologists, traditional Chinese medicine doc- I actually remember going to a tra- traditional Chinese medicine doctor and i remember having this like it was like tree bark like it was it was a weird concoction and i had to make this huge vat it was like a tea and i still remember the smell of it it was wasn't pleasant and i remember drinking that for months and i don't know if that helped i don't know so we tried all sorts of different stuff but i think you know being relatively young you know 16 ish it's not like i was you know living on my own had my own resources to go to find my own stuff so i just started like really 
you know, introspectively doing some thinking and research. And eventually this is back in the day when like Encyclopedia Britannica was still the main thing, right? So like Google wasn't a thing. I think like now it would have been a, a little bit of a different scenario, but I think it really, it really inspired me to want to learn more about like, why, like, why was this happening? Cause I didn't have any answers. If I went to the doctor and they're like, well, eh, there's not much we can do, but we could do this. And I had really bad eczema growing up as well. And I always remember like the solution to eczema or eczema was just like put more cortisone cream on. And it was never dealing with the root issue. That never really made sense to me. And so I really wanted to figure out what was going on. And that's, that's kind of eventually, you know, what prompted me to, to get into these studies and doing a lot more reading and research and experimentation. Um, and then, I mean, I realized like, you know, for a lot of doctors, like medical doctors, I think that they know what they know. And they're very good at diagnosing and prescribing in a lot of cases, medication. There's others that are a little bit more holistic and you know functional based, and they might have a different alternative point of view. I traditionally resonated more with that because growing up, uh, my body was pretty much a toxic wasteland from just very bad food choices because I didn't know better based on what I was exposed to. Um, antibiotics, vaccines, like it was just ridiculous. So as I started learning a lot of this stuff, I was like, huh, maybe this is starting to make sense. And then I said, okay, well, what if I were to do this and, and maybe eat a little bit better and remove some of these, you know, problematic foods. And that was, that was the journey, right? So it was just kind of learning and experimenting and, and seeing how my body responded. And I, and I, and I quickly recognized that how I felt was a really important indicator of, of the overall health of my body. Cause I was really tired for a long time. Like half my life I spent sleeping pretty much. And that's why I went on to write the book, The All Day Energy Diet, because as I made these changes, like the most profound difference I noticed instantaneously was my energy level was like through the roof. And it's just so happened that as that, that energy went up, my hair started coming back, my health improved. And I was like, huh, that's good to know. Energy first, outcomes, you know, those other outcomes second. So that was um, one of the really big discoveries in, in my journey for sure. Yeah, there are people who have come on the podcast, very well-regarded professionals. And one of the big things that I've noticed is a trend of what they've been saying is that you are your best scientist. Like we had Dr. Michael Bruce, one of the world's top sleep doctors, and he was saying that rather than everyone using sleep trackers, it's waking up. And he said, I would argue that how you feel when you wake up is much mm -hmm. better than any sleep tracker and thing like that. So being able to, to experiment firsthand and, and see in real time how you're feeling or any other physio physiological benefits made a big difference to you. And I, I worry that there are people out there you mentioned energy levels i worry there are people out there who don't know that a healthier life actually awaits because of their information and their lack of energy and any other symptoms that they might have are just what they are used to and as a result of that they don't know any different so i know this seems like a bit of a, a simple question but how should a healthy person actually feel good like so here's the funny thing is i never really used to drink coffee and i was like caffeine's the devil and I still think it's not that great, uh, but I don't know what happened along the way. I started enjoying coffee. So I, I have a coffee every morning now and I'm one of those guys. Um, but what I, back in the day when I wrote the all day energy diet and I was going through this whole process, I recognized I'm like, how is it, how does it make sense that like people say I can't start my day without a cup of coffee. I don't understand how that's normal, right? That shouldn't be a thing. Like you should wake up and you should feel good. And if you want to have a coffee, it's not because you have to have one to feel like normal. It's because you want to have one. And I think most people don't know how good they can feel because they've never felt that. It's almost like the, Tr uh, the Truman Show. Have you ever seen that movie with mm -hmm. Jim Carrey? Right, where he's in his own world and he's like, at that one point in the movie, he walks up the stairs and he's like, opens the door and there's something on the other side. It's like, this whole thing has been a, a set it's like, that's kind of the world we, we live in. It's like, we don't even know what's on the other side of the wall until we've been on the other side of the wall. And then it's like, oh, wow, I feel a thousand times better. And I think that's really important because any one of us can say, oh, like do this and you'll feel better. It's so much, you know, whatever. But none of us, that, that, like none of us clue into that until we actually experience it. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that I was, always really um, espousing with our clients was like, do this for a couple of days, do this for two weeks, just see how you feel. 
And then you can go back to the way you were eating before or not. And the thing is like, at that point, it's your choice. Like, just like, holy cow, why would I want to go back and do what I was doing before if I feel this good? And at least now you can make a choice from a place of power where you've experienced it. And now you have the choice to go direction one or direction two. And I think that's, that's really powerful because it's coming from a place of like you owning that and having been exposed to how good you can feel. And now the responsibility of the choice is up to you based on that. So I think a lot of people don't, I don't even think they've touched the surface of how good they can feel. And I don't even think age matters because we've had clients that have been like in their seventies who are like in five days feeling like new people. I'm like, that's pretty amazing. So yeah, I think at the very minimum, just give yourself an opportunity to just cut away some of the distractions and some of the vices. And if it's uncomfortable, it's going to be uncomfortable. But just give yourself that opportunity to feel how good you can feel and do it for a week or two and then make and then be like, okay, well, do I want to go back to the way I was before or continue on this way? And then you can make a choice from there. But I think it's it's important to at least experience it once. Yeah, such great advice. And, and for those who are watching this on YouTube or listening to the podcast and don't really properly understand Yuri's expertise, you've helped what more than half a million people get take ownership of the of their health. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he knows exactly what he's talking about. Well, we know a lot of adults out there, they might know the difference between being fit and versus healthy, but there are teenagers out there who might be naturally lean or just naturally more active. How do we get teenagers to start to understand the difference between some type of sustainable health for those people who really can't understand that that early where their consequences don't have as big of their actions as it would when they're older? I think there needs to be some type of technology developed that can fast forward them to when they're 50. And be like, oh, okay. Cause I was that guy. I was that guy. And like, and I've and I worked as as a coach at the University of Toronto with the men's soccer program for seven years. So kid, uh, teenagers 17 to about 21. And it's every year is the same. The same thing, same thing, same thing. I was the guy who even Donald's and then go across the road to our stadium and get ready for a game. Like that was me when I was a teenager. And I was still like a really good soccer player. And when I was coaching at the University of Toronto, one of my, I think one of my proudest legacies, if I could call it that, is the fact that instead of guys coming to the stadium with like gummy bears or McDonald's, they were coming to the stadium with green juices because there was a, a vegetarian restaurant not too far away. And, you know, like a green juice is like 10 bucks, right? So for a student, that's not like, like it's not cheap. And it was really cool to see like th these teachings and kind of living this and seeing how these guys were 16, 17, 18 coming into the stadium with green juices. I was like, my work, my work here is done. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think what it, what's the saying? Like the, the youth is the youth is wasted on the young, something like that. And that's the way it is. Like we don't realize how good we have it until we don't have it anymore. And I think we're like, we're invincible when we're young. You know, I've got four boys under 10. They never get tired. Like I'm thinking they're like dogs and I can just wear them out. They just keep going. And it's, I'd be cool if you could do that forever. But I think by the time you're, you know, 35, 40, things start to change a bit. So I'm not too sure. I think the key, I think there's a certain aspect of maturity that comes with it. I think where there's, you know, there's certain teenagers who are a little bit more forward thinking, they've been a bit more mature. They, they realize because they're, they're a bit more tuned into themselves and performance that they can't get away with that forever. But I also do think a lot of high level athletes that they look up to can be really good role models because, you know, if you're growing up in the seventies and eighties and your role models are like John McEnroe's and guy, like I love John, McEnroe. John, John Daly on the golf course. <laughs> yeah, totally. Right. It's, it's a very different role model than like the Novak Djokovic's or the Roger Federer's or, you know, other role models for maybe a bit healthier in the way that they approach the game. Uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, like these are all great examples of guys who they, they, they're not just great athletes, but they live a very clean life. And I think those are great examples for teenagers who want to emulate in their footsteps. So again, whether they're athletes or not, I think it's important to have good role models that really uh, espouse that because we become a, a reflection of our environments. You know, my kids are getting into like skateboarding and there's a skate park by our place. And I'm very, I'm very 
uh, fascinated by the culture of, of skateboarding. Uh, I think it's a really cool sport. I'm terrible at it, but kind of sitting there and observing it, it's like, you know, they all dress very similarly. They all have their monster drinks. Uh, one guy last week, he's on a skateboard. He's got a cigarette in his mouth as he's going up the half pipe. I'm like, this is a very different culture or hopefully not role models um, that my kids would be exposed to, right? So I think it's important to look at who our role models are and, and what that environment looks like. Yeah, and helping encourage the the discipline that can lead to the goals and the outcomes that, that people want. So yeah, very, very well yeah. said. It actually reminds me of, I had Gabby Reese on the show, who you're probably familiar with early yeah. this year, and she had some amazing insights. But one of the big one was that she said that the best way for people, if they're actually truly grateful about something, is not to talk about it. It's to actually look after it and take care of it to the best of your ability. And what she was talking about mm-hmm. in that context was your physical health, which, of course, you only look after through things like the right food and the right exercise. Yet people, they want that magic bullet to success. People want to be able to lose 10 pounds of fat overnight or gain 10 pounds of muscle or whatever it might be. So how do we actually get through to people the importance of sustainable change in such a transactional world when everyone just wants that magic bullet? I think the same thing happens in business as well with this. Like I think it's what people are seeing, right? So they're seeing the after on Instagram, for instance, and they don't see the journey. And I think that's a major issue. And it's something I was actually speaking with my clients this morning with about uh, Seth Godin has a really good book on this topic called The Dip. And the whole idea is like, listen, like to be great at anything, there's very few people that are amazing at what they do, right? And they're more valuable because it's more scarce. There's fewer people that are at that level. And so at the Gabby Reese's, you know, the Laird Hamilton's, et cetera, and the difference is that everyone says they want to do that. They want to become that person. But as soon as the dip happens, which is that, oh, this is hard, they give up. And the difference is that the select few recognize that either before or during and say, I'm just going to keep going and figure it out until I get through that dip. That journey needs to be, that, that needs to be highlighted in some way, shape or form in a way that it's not right now. And to be honest, I don't know if that ever will be because humans want what we want. We want the, we're very, uh, we're very compelled by things that are new and shiny and alluring. And although we're inspired by courage on the journey, that's not the thing that really grabs our attention right away. And I do think like, if you look at the example of P90X, so P90X came into the market at a time where infomercials were promoting six minute abs and sauna belts, which are like these overnight, you know, magic pills. And here comes P90X saying, uh, this is gonna be the hardest thing you do for 90 days, but it's gonna transform your body. They've done pretty well. That's gonna do about a billion dollars in sales as a company, Peach Body. And that, I, I think that goes to show that there's always gonna be a segment of the market that understands that the quick fixes don't work. And at some level, I think everyone needs to come to that epiphany because they've done the diets, they've done the pills, they've done all the stuff. They've tried one business model, one tactic, and it hasn't worked out. And at some point, and where that point is in someone's life, I don't know, it it could be early, it could be later. Everyone will come to a realization where it's like, if you want to do something great, it's not going to be easy. And if you're not okay with that, you should quit before you even start as opposed to quitting halfway through. And if you are okay with the fact that it's gonna be challenging and full of ups and downs, then recognize that and find a way to get through that. Whether that's through coaching, mentorship, being in a surrounding that's gonna inspire you, have the right support. I think those are all really important, but it would be like someone who's never worked out before and the trainer's like, you know what? We're gonna help you get an amazing shape. You're gonna feel amazing. This is gonna be so good. And then the next day, the client is so sore, they can't even move because they've never done half this stuff. And the trainer, and they're like, well, what's this all about? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I forgot to mention. There's a thing called delayed onset muscle soreness. <laughs> I think it'd be a service to the client to upfront be like, listen, here's what it's going to take to lose 20 pounds. It's going to be hard. You're going to have moments where you want to quit. There'll be times you want to cry. There'll be times you'll be swearing at me. And there'll be many times where you want to give up. Are you okay with that? Because if you're not, you're not going to achieve the goal that you want. And I think in today's day and age, hype and hyperbole, people see through all that stuff. And it's just, it's overdone. And I think there's a lot of value in 
I don't even want to call it authentic communication. It's just the honest truth. So just being honest with your market or your clients or your messaging or whatever it is you do yourself. I mean, like it just becomes so much more believable from a business perspective, but also as an individual pursuing a goal, it becomes a lot more believable to be like, okay, cool. This is going to be tough. How do I, how do I prepare for the challenges and get myself okay with meeting those? I think that's really important because otherwise everything is a surprise. You're like, Oh shit, I didn't think it was going to be so hard. So I think that that mindset shift is super important. Yeah. And especially as a business owner, which is probably the perfect segue now for us to switch gears and focus on things on the business side. As a business owner, you only want to work with people who are, who are serious about having that, that transformation. I mean, how frustrating is it when there are people out there who we think even naively, that was a big learning for me that naively I thought that I could help everyone And sometimes what I realized was that rather than me bringing them up, they were actually pulling me down. Have you ever had any experiences like that where you thought that you were able to help everyone, but just the people that you were going after, they weren't committed. And as a result, you weren't bringing them up. They were having the opposite effect on you. Oh yeah, totally. That that was one of my biggest crises as a health expert was I wanted to help everyone. And it took me a long time to swallow the pill of the people who need it the most very often want it the least. And I was like, that sucks. Um, And it's the reality, you know, even on, you know, how we help clients now on the business front, we don't even talk about sales. For us, it's interviewing. It's we're going to hire this client if they fit our criteria, because we don't want someone's money. We want their transformation. And we're very, very clear with people up front about how challenging it's going to be. But it's going to be challenging either way. The difference is that you're going to have guidance and coaching and a proven model with our help versus doing it by yourself. But I think it's a major disservice to people on the business side. And I think this is where business and marketing get a bit of a bad rap. There's just a lot of over-the-top promises. Oh, make 100K in a month or whatever. And they focus on the shiny without the dirt along the way. Mm. You know, it's like, hey, just go into the mine. You'll find gold sitting there. It's like, no, no, no. You got to like chip away at the wall, shine off the dirt and oh, it's a dud and then still keep going. And I think it's really, really important to to have that conversation with people before you even consider engaging with them because otherwise you're just taking people down a delusional path. And if we want clients or or customers who are committed to the, I think this is more, maybe a bit more applicable to a coaching type of environment. If you're selling widgets, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit easier, a little bit different, but I do think it's, honest communication, being transparent about the journey is in your best interest, but it's also in the client's best interest because you're going to have better clients who are like, yep, I understand that. And uh, I'm willing to sign up for this. And there's no surprises, right? Because you've laid everything out. You've laid the gauntlet in front of them. So, yeah. Yeah. And they probably appreciate that transparency. They might, they might not, they might not like hearing it immediately in the present, but they also know then that you're focused on the transformation rather than the the transaction. And you had, you had seven years where you were working as a, as a trainer and nutritionist, uh, working with people one-on-one, but you hit a wall with, with that career. What was the turning point for you in recognizing that there had to be a better way than seeing people one-on-one, which is essentially, I guess, exchanging time for money. Yeah. Well, if I hadn't lost my hair when I was 16, I probably would have lost it after doing all that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean like 12 to 14 hour days, seven in the morning till seven at night. And then I was actually working at the university as, uh, as one of the coaches with the soccer team. So it was like, like seven till 10 at night, like every day. And I realized like as much as I loved helping my clients, transform and and like hanging out with them. And that was, it was great. I I realized like there's, there's a really low ceiling here. Like there's, I'm not going very far in terms of impact income, et cetera. And I think the big turning point for me was 2006. I went to Europe with my girlfriend, now wife, and we were over there for six weeks, but trading time for dollars for so many years, I had to save up a bunch of money for the trip. And then when we took the trip, Every single time we went out to eat or purchase something, that money was going down and nothing else was coming in. And I'm like, I never, ever, ever want to experience this again. And so I I was just committed to finding a way to, the question I was always asking was like, how do I make more money? How do I help more people, even if I'm not present with them? It wasn't, it was never about how do I make more money without doing any work? That was never the conversation for me. It was how do I 
make more money in the service of more people to help them get in, in even better results, but without relying on my time. And because I have, I love helping people. And like, I, I, I can't even imagine retiring. Like one day on the beach for me and I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me get back to help from someone, right? That's just the way I am. So it's the money definitely is great, but it's in the service of other people. So I always thought about how does that, how does, how do I do that? And I remember toward the tail end of those seven years, I was working out with a client and he's like huffing and puffing. He's like, why don't you put your voice on tape? I was like, huh, that's interesting. This is just when the iPod had come out. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but let me think about this. <laughs> and so what I, what I eventually ended up doing was I thought to myself, okay, what would, how would I help my clients get a result if I were not with them, but kind of still with them? And so what I did is I actually recorded a full workout, uh, like a 90 day workout program where my voice was on their headphones, guiding them through their workout as if I was with them right there. And we were actually one of the first companies back in the day to even have that type of technology. And it was awesome because essentially what it, it allowed me to do is it allowed me to productize my service. And that was my first, without even knowing it at the time, that was my first kind of step into extracting intellectual property and creating value and transformation for people without me being present every step of the way. And, you know, is an audio guided workout as effective as working with a trainer? No, but it's pretty darn close instead of doing it by themselves. And that's kind of how things started with the online side of things. And even now with our clients, like all of our coaching is group-based and we have hundreds of clients who get amazing results, but I don't spend one-on-one -on -one time with every single one of them every second of the day. And the reason that's, you know, really anyone's able to do that is by stepping back and really assessing, how do I do what I do? Like, what's the recipe through which I help people achieve an outcome? And really starting to extract it, articulate it, and then map that out in some type of curriculum that they can follow. But then you come on top with accountability, support, and coaching. And that was, that, I mean, it's just, it's just incredible to see the transformation that people get. Because with my health business, the thing that I realized, so as I, as I went from the one-on-one, -on -one, which was like, just, I'm like, I never want to do coaching ever again. I went the complete opposite to, to like, I'm going to go online and live the laptop lifestyle. I'm going to sell eBooks and all that kind of stuff and kick my feet up. <laughs> Didn't happen. Uh, it's a lot of work. And so what happened is eventually when that business, you know, took off, I got so disillusioned from it because we, we had helped so many people on paper, but I didn't know any of them, right? If someone purchased a workout program or a book of mine or a course, the likelihood of them actually doing it and getting the results, I don't know, right? Like they're on the other side of the world. Are they actually doing it? And so I became very disconnected from the people that, was, that we were serving. And I wanted a way to, to come back to really impacting people in a way where I actually knew them I could see their transformation. And with Healthpreneur, that's, you know, kind of what we come back to. So I went from one-on-one -on -one kind of like despising it all the way to the other side, which is very product-based. And now coming back to the middle, which is high touch coaching in a leverage format with those elements of productizing our service and bringing the best of both worlds together. So again, everything happens for a reason, right? But I think it, as long as we learn from it, you know, and improve our future. That's, I think that's what I did. So that's, uh, that's how that all kind of came to be. Definitely. A lot of the stuff that you're talking about here is by going back and questioning the underlying uh, assumptions that people had made that you can actually have more of an impact and earn more of an income without having to exchange time for money, which I think is a really, really great lesson for, for people to think about. What about people who might be thinking it's okay for you to go and do that? It's impossible for me to duplicate my expertise. Is it possible for pretty much everyone out there to be able to duplicate themselves to, to build more of an empire that they can scale? Uh, it's both possible and impossible depending on how they choose to see it. And we had a client this morning who was a naturopathic doctor. She loves traveling and she was just like, I love the fact that I can help people when I'm in Hawaii or Alaska or wherever else. And she said this several times, and I know this to be true, is like her clients get better results virtually without the one-on-one. -on -one, so in a more of a group setting than they were coming to her clinic. And I was like, yeah, it's amazing, right? So cool. Because the thing is, 
when you don't, so with, will we help health professionals, right? So chiros, naturopaths, health coaches, et cetera, that model is very broken. It is fundamentally broken because it's transactional, which means let's say I've got a bummed back. I go see my chiro. He gives me an adjustment. I give him 50 bucks and I leave. And then the next time I have an issue, I come back, same thing. So it's very much tick for tat and there's no, there's no journey. There's no, here's what we should do between sessions, et cetera. And it's not transformational. It's very transactional. So it's not good for the patient. It's not good for the practitioner and it's not sustainable. So the thing is we, we speak with quite a few people who are like, well, I'm, I'm a bit different. My situation's a bit different because I do something that no one else can do. And I'm like, awesome. That's amazing. You've got two choices. You can let that story shackle you to the, you know, to the situation you're dealing with right now of like low income, no freedom and tell yourself you're a special snowflake, or you can find a way to extract that magic and figure out a way to help more people. So you have two choices. That's it. And this is, you know, with COVID, um, because we help practitioners build their virtual practice, we had a lot of chiropractors, physical therapists, like really hands-on practitioners, especially during COVID who came to us were like, hey, like my clinic shut down. I got to figure out, figure out how to go online. And then be, they're like, well, like, I don't know how I could do this. And I'm like, you've got two choices. You go out of business based on your current situation, or you figure out a way to do this. And some people are like, yep, let's do it. And like Charlie, one of our car, uh, one of our physical therapist clients, the most he made in a month in his clinic was 10,000 a month. Since he's been with us online, he's doing regularly 30 to 40 K a month. And his, and his clients get better results with sciatica and back pain. And it's because like in this fashion, you have to change the way you help people, the delivery, which means the client has to show up in a different way they become more empowered in their own journey as opposed to just kind of showing up, laying on a table, getting a crack and leaving. So it really benefits the practitioner, the coach, it benefits the client because everyone is, the delivery is based on the outcome, not just like, hey, I'll see you for half an hour, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think every single person can help people in a virtual, virtual manner, but also in a way that's not necessarily one-on-one. -on -one unless you're dealing with like deep traumatic stuff, right? So if you're a psychotherapist as, that, as an example, however, there are still ways to do that in a group setting because you don't like not every single interaction with your clients needs to be with you. If you brought 10 women together who are all dealing with the same issue, they have a community now. They have like, they're part of a tribe of other women who are like-minded and they're like, man, you're going through this too. Let's support each other. Isolation kills, community heals. So I think it's in our client's best interest to put them in a supportive environment. And then in whatever way that looks like in terms of your support and coaching, there's tremendous ways to help people beyond the one-on-one. -on -one. So there's definitely ways. All it comes down to is being creative and willing to adapt as opposed to being very stuck in ways that may not support you. Mm. What, what about those who want to serve an audience who don't have the capacity to pay? Or for the most part, they don't have the capacity to pay. How do you provide the support that you need for that audience that you might be super passionate about, but uh, you obviously don't want to burn out in, in the process? I mean, if you're spending all of your time servicing clients for, for a dollar a day, you're going to reach a point where you, you burn out and you're not able to help anyone. Yeah. I mean, who you choose to serve is one of the most important questions that's going to determine the success of your business and your 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 life, I think, because if you want to help everyone who doesn't have money, because you have a connection to that, that's amazing. But you have to understand that if they don't have money, they can't pay you. Um, so the way I look at it is, so our, a lot of the, the typical marketing advice or business advice is like start people low and then build them up an ascension ladder to a higher point. Our philosophy is exact opposite is for people to get transformational results, it doesn't come from a $7 ebook. It comes from a higher level coaching program where you work with them, they get an amazing result. You fill up your cup financially, they get amazing results. You now have more social proof that can feed back into your marketing and attract more clients like that. So if you fill up your cup first, let's just use dollars and cents as an example, 
then you have more dollars and cents to then give back to the 95% of those other people who would not be able to afford your services in the first place. So it's almost like a Robin Hood you know, type of approach where it's, I don't even want to say you take from the rich gift to the poor, but <laughs> you work with people at a higher level who can afford your services, who see, it's not even that they can afford, they see the value in it at least, they pay you. And then as you build up your business, as you build up, like first and foremost, you have to take care of yourself because if you don't, you can't take care of anyone else. But once you're at a point of your business where, you know, you can take a portion and, and give to charity or you set up a foundation or even like, I think so many people get caught up in like all these little, like little products, you know, 10 bucks here, $97 here. I was that guy. Like I had hundreds of products in my other business. And with Healthpreneur, we have two. We have our coaching program and our mastermind. And we've got, you know, one other little thing that we try and decide just for, for low end stuff. But pretty much everything else is pretty much free because we can give it all away because we don't need to make sure that everything turns into, you know, some funnel or a book sale or whatever. It's like, if it, if it helps people, we can give it away for free mostly because we we're taking, we're good because of this stuff. So that's, that's my approach. Uh, it's worked tremendously well for us. It makes a lot of sense for our clients because a lot of our clients feel like martyrs in the service of others. And that's not a good place to be. And I think we're all here because we want to help a lot of people, but you got to help yourself first. So, yeah. Yeah, very, very true. You've worked with so many high achievers all around the world. What, what's the difference between the top 1% or 0.1% of people who might be seven-figure or eight-figure entrepreneurs or people who are at the absolute pinnacle of their industry? What do they do differently? Or is there a common trait that they have that other people don't? Uh, it's such a good question. So I'll give you two very clear examples of this. So we have a client who last February, so as the whole pandemic is just about to start, um, he's interested in working with us. And I told him, I'm like, I think you're a little bit early. And he was making about 800 bucks a month at the time as a, as a health coach. And he told me, he's like, no, I can do this. Watch me. And I was like, okay. 12 months later, he's doing hundred grand a month, helping thousands more people than he ever was. That statement says everything. No, I can do this, watch me. Embedded in that statement is a massive amount of self-belief. That is the single most important ingredient anyone can have to achieve success. If I see someone and their answer is, well, maybe, no, you're finished. Like it's, it's that instantaneous versus someone who's like, no, I'll figure this out. Watch. That's a, that like, that's the big thing right there. Second story. Second quick example is we had a, a client who in November, 2019 was on the verge of bankruptcy. He was a chiropractor had six people in his office, five daughters at home. He had to take a $40,000 loan just to survive. He comes across our stuff at the end of November and he's like, I need to do this. This makes a lot of sense. So he starts working with us. The first post he posts inside of our Facebook group and we teach people how to run Facebook ads into, you know, whatever. Um, so his first post was celebrating that he was negative $14,000 in the hole. And I was like, this guy gets it. He's like, I'm so excited. We spent $14,000. We haven't seen a single thing in return yet. However, we have 300 client or prospect calls on the books for the next month and a half. I'm like, this guy's going to kill it. By July of 2020, they're doing $1.5 million a month. And so what is, what's the difference? The difference, again, in his case, was a belief in himself that he would do this and he'd figure this out. Uh, the example of the first client they gave you is the same, is the same thing. So self-belief is huge. Second thing is courage. You got to like, especially as an entrepreneur, there's no guarantee. You're like, Hey, what's the guarantee for this? I want to know it's going to work out. The very fact that you ask that question tells me this is not going to work out for you because people who have courage and belief in themselves, they know they're going to make it work. Right. And that's a big thing. So the courage to step into the fear, to step into the unknown, because you believe in yourself enough to make it work with the right type of support around you. I think those two things beyond anything else make the biggest difference, at least in my experience. 
Yeah, that second one, the courage you mentioned there reminds me very much of faith, which is one of the principles of Napoleon Hill's Thinking Grow Rich, which I'm sure yeah. you're aware. That first one that you mentioned about self-belief, how coachable is that? Is that one of those things where it's like you, you have it or you don't? I don't know. I mean, I, I've... Well, perhaps it comes back down to that thing about the people that, are, you know, the right, what's the, what's the quote about if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll spend its whole life thinking it's stupid. The right environment can really yeah. bring out that, that will to win in people. And that's, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, for sure. Like, I think, I mean, I mean, I'm sure parenting has a piece in this for sure. If you're brought up at a young age with parents who are like, yeah, I believe in you, you can do this. That, that probably helps a lot. But I think the thing is like, we all, if we really think about this, we all have many wins in our life. It's just those, I think, who, who are a little bit more poo-poo on themselves or a little bit less on the self-belief side, I think they tend to focus on the things that didn't work out as well for them. Because self-belief, I believe, is something that you can dial up or dial down. And it, it changes based on the situation. Like, I don't have a lot of confidence in dancing, but you put me on a soccer pitch, I'm very confident, right? But the thing is, the reason I'm confident in soccer is because I've, I played it for so long and I had so many wins and, and reference points, but I also had many failures, but I also got really good because of the failures and the mistakes. I tell my kids, I'm like, guys, as a goalie, I played it when I was 10 years old. I was playing on teams, we were losing 15, nothing, right? That's 15 goals against me. <laughs> that kills your confidence. But again, it's perspective. It's like, hey, I got the benefit of facing 25 shots. 15 of them went in but I saved 10. The other goalie maybe didn't have one. I don't know. So I think perspective is a big thing. It's like how we see the coin. Is it this side or this side? I think makes a huge difference now into the future, but also in the past. So I think for those who are a little bit low on the self-confidence or self-belief is just do a simple exercise. And you can do this every day is look back in your life and make a note of three moments that were, let's say, big successes for you. So it could be a sporting success. It could be an achievement in school. It could be giving birth to kids. It could be whatever it is. And don't discount those. Like really, really like think about, man, like that's a big deal. Like that was remarkable. And understand that if you can do that, if you do that there, that success leaves clues and success is transferable. And so starting to really build that success muscle, I think is important because the more you can do that, and then on a daily basis, like what are three wins that I had today? Because confidence is all based on momentum. And if we focus on the right things and we do it more, that's going to build our self-belief and we're more likely to have courage to take on more things in the future. So that's, that's what I would uh, recommend for that. Love that. Great advice. Well, last question before we move into the rocket round. I know that you and I are both very much focused on continuing to continuing to grow. What do you do? Is there anything that you uh, include in your calendar to make sure that you're getting out of your comfort zone on a regular basis to keep growing? Yeah. First thing I do every morning at about 4 a.m. is I jump in a cold plunge. So four degrees Celsius and I sit in there for three minutes. And I do that because I'm like, Health benefits, sure. But for me, it's like, if I can do the most challenging thing of my day at four in the morning, everything else will be a little bit easier. So that's the first thing. Uh, it also helps, like, I like putting myself in situations where I'm like sympathetically challenged, like really like, you know, cold plunge, like fight or flight, and then trying to find calm. I call it the calm of the eye of the storm, right? So trying to center within the chaos. I've got four kids under 10. It's like, that's like, 24 seven, right? So how do I center myself and stay calm with the chaos? I'm not perfect. I lose my cool sometimes, but I think that's one thing I do. Um, so I like to get uncomfortable first thing in the morning. Second thing I would say just from a growth perspective, I listen to, or I read a tremendous amount. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, growth is a major value of mine and our company in general. And so always learning and growing uh, is, has been huge. And then I think the other thing for me personally has been embracing, I'd say what's even more challenging by like an exponential amount than sitting in an ice bath is having hard conversations with other humans. Yeah. That's, that's always been my Achilles heel and I've never wanted to ruffle feathers or whatever. And that's cost me a lot of time and frustration and, and maybe some, some team members in the past that maybe should have gone a little bit sooner than, than they did. And I, I've really, really been aware of that and started to nip that in the bud. 
to be like, hey, if I have to have a conversation with someone, it's got to happen now because I'm not going to tuck away this problem and expect it to go away. So that for me personally is probably, it's more challenging than a tough workout, more challenging than a cold plunge. And because of that, I really, I really have to be intentional about making that a, not maybe not daily, but a few times a week type of thing. So, yeah. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Well, let's now move into the, what we call the win the day rocket round. 10 questions for some fairly quick answers. You ready for this one, Yuri? Bring it. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Uh, success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Winston Churchill. That's so one great. of all time. Yeah, so great. Number two, I think I might know your answer to this one. Morning coffee or evening wine? Morning coffee, for sure. Number three, what's one bit of advice you'd give your 18-year-old self? Choose your environment wisely. Yeah, wow. That one... <laughs> I feel like that one is such a big thing, isn't it? We've spoken about environment so much throughout this episode. That's really, really important. Number four, what book do you gift the most? The One Thing. Love it. Uh, number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Hmm. Almost might be your entire life on this, this journey of, of health that you've been on, being confronted with that adversity early on has given you a, such a great perspective. I, I think... Uh, being okay with with who I who I am because for two years I actually painted on fake eyebrows with this, this veil of shame, and I think as a result of that I realized that like my superpower is just being me, and giving others permission to do the same. So yeah, you know we had Jessica Cox on the show who was the world's first armless pilot, and she said one of the most liberating days for her was when she just got rid of these fake arms and said, you know what, this is this is who I am, universe, and wow. and was much happier from there. Yeah, yeah it's amazing. Love it. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? It's amazing. Look forward to it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? I'd say Tony Robbins, just because he's, I think he was my, you know, he popped my personal growth cherry way back in the day. So, yeah. <laughs> and he's been around the block. He might have some good stories for you too, I'm sure. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Um, I would say Google, Google Docs. That's the weirdest. I don't, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to say that, but I love Google Docs because I don't need to be connected to the internet to get my creativity down. So I've really, I've really appreciated that platform. Yeah. Great collaborating with teams too. Well, num yeah. number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. I know you've done a lot already. <laughs> Man, there's, there's a lot, uh, but I'd say one of the big ones is to uh, drive an F1 car. And the second one would be to fly in a fighter jet. Awesome. Well, number 10, final question. What's one thing you do to win the day? I get my most important work done first thing in the morning. Great advice. Well, there are a bunch of ways you can connect with Yuri and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Healthpreneur, grab a copy of his new book, The Strong 60 on Amazon and visit his website, healthpreneurgroup.com, healthpreneurgroup.com. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Yuri, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, dude, this is fun. Thanks so much for having me, James. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Yuri Elkame. He's kicking enormous goals in the business world and he's the real deal. Don't forget, action is the most important thing. So take the value bombs you've learned from this episode and apply them in your own life and business. Again, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. And if you enjoyed this episode, hit that subscribe button. And if you want to do me a favor, give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Win the Day with James Whitaker is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, and wherever you listen to podcasts. That's all for this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always. <laughs>